Hi, welcome. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time for joining us. So excited to uh, have you here. My name is Josh Clark. I'm the head of school of Landmark School in uh, just north of Boston, Massachusetts in Beverly. Uh, and I'm so glad that you're spending a little bit of time of your evening uh, as we talk and dive in a little bit more into really trying to understand what is this dyslexia thing that we talk about so much? What is dyslexia? What does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and how uh, might we be able to uh, better support it and understand it? So with that, um, again, I want to I want to dive in. I'm um, kind of the theme for the night uh, is this idea of understanding dyslexia really through any era. Uh, and I'm going to kind of walk you through that as we go. If you can't already tell, or if you if you don't, if, you're, if you already know me, you probably are uh, familiar with this. But if you can't tell, um, otherwise, from just seeing this opening screen, I'm also a really big Taylor Swift fan. So I apologize in advance uh, for all the Swifty references as we go through. Um, but it's more for my own entertainment than anything else. So I appreciate you uh, humoring me as we we go. Um, so again, we're going to launch right into it. Again, if you have any questions, put them in that Q&A. I won't be able to see the Q&A in real time myself, um, be just because I have my screen um, all the way up for the presentation, but I have a colleague that will shoot me uh, those uh, questions and I'll try to address them either as I go or likely at the end uh, as well. So with that, I'm um, going to jump right in. Again, many of you might already uh, be familiar with me uh, uh, and uh, who I am with Landmark, but just in case, I thought it'd be helpful to give you a little bit more background on myself. So uh, uh, again, my name is Josh Clark. Um, uh, in addition to being the head of school at the Landmark School, which you can see on the screen here, that beautiful ocean view, um, I am also have the, the distinct honor of being the uh, chair of the board of the International Dyslexia Association, um, which is uh, the world's uh, uh, oldest and most prominent um, uh, dyslexia advocacy group, um, really trying to bridge that uh, uh, research to practice. So taking what we, we know about uh, dyslexia uh, through the uh, latest research uh, in science, and how do we apply that um, uh, to classrooms? And more importantly, how do we get that to kids? Uh, so I'm, I'm super uh, proud of my involvement in that work. I am also uh, the, uh, very involved uh, with a group called Made by Dyslexia, which is an international non-for-profit um, that is UK-based, that has a, a stated mission of changing the world's understanding of dyslexia from a disability into a valued difference. So I, uh, I'm uh, super appreciative of all the work I get to do with that. And again, um, like I, I mentioned in the beginning, I am also head at Landmark School, uh, a school for students with dyslexia and related language-based learning differences in uh, grades second through 12th grade. Um, and in our high school, we have a day and boarding program. Um, I also come by this work naturally. Uh, uh, so again, if you've, if you've seen me talk before, you might be uh, familiar with this slide, but I always think it's important to talk about what brings us to this work, what brings me um, uh, to this particular uh, passion and, uh, and, and advocacy. Um, and that's um, really a lot of it is my own experience uh, growing up. And so um, if you ever had this experience yourself um, in the last, gosh, five years or so, my mom uh, moved. And if you've ever had a parent move, um, you might have had the experience where you get a box. You get a box that you never even knew existed. And I always joke, uh, I got this box and I found out my mom's a witch because uh, it had my teeth and my hair in it, right, as, as, a, as a young child. But it also had all this collection of schoolwork that my mom uh, had collected uh, and saved um, from my childhood. Again, I had no idea she had it. Um, and when you when I'm looking at it now in retrospect, it, it is just such a clear picture of how I ended up doing what I do today. Uh, uh, beginning with this first uh, picture here, this is, uh, I think it was in third or fourth grade. And we had to write a letter to the president. And at the time, it was the first President Bush. And that might be kind of hard for you to see on your screen, so I'll, I'll read it to you. But it says, "Dear Bush," right? Because I was I was on a uh, uh, you know very direct with the president. Dear Bush, let's talk money. If you give me one thousand dollars, I'll give you my brother. So will you go for it? Uh, please send money March twentieth through the twenty fifth. Clearly, that was my spring break, and I needed cash. Um, and you better not change your mind because the world is in danger because of my brother. And what you can see uh, in that uh, uh, letter that might be, again, difficult for, for you to, to really understand on your screen, but 
under every word that I wrote, uh, pretty much my teacher had to go under and decipher it because uh, without that uh, context, the spelling was so atrocious and 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 such a a uh, disconnect between what I was trying to say and how I was representing it that again she had to go through and and decipher every single uh, word for me. Um, and you could tell as the letter goes on towards the bottom there, my handwriting becomes more compromised and the spelling becomes even more uh, uh, disjointed. I, 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 uh, when I try to write change your mind, I have J-U in there, right? Because I'm just kind of grappling for it, right? And then um, right next to that, uh, in the middle uh, uh, panel there, those are what um, were my TCAP scores. So I grew up in Tennessee uh, and uh, we had um, you know, mandated state tests, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, and that highlighted uh, a column right there, that was my national percentile. So that was how I did uh, on the state, uh, the state test compared to a kind of a national uh, normed group. And what you'll see there is when you look at my, my reading comprehension, right, my ability to understand text, I was in the 89th percentile, which is pretty high, right? So I actually did better than 89, 89% uh, of, of my peers. But then when you go down a little bit to word analysis, which is really just phonics, that's reading individual words, I was in the 41st percentile. So here I was understanding things, right, almost the 90th percentile, but when I actually had to read isolated words, I was in the 41st, right? Um, and then you keep looking at it, my language mechanics, my grammar was in the 30th percentile. My math concepts and applications was in the 20th percentile. Um, I always think it's funny because my spelling was in the 67th percentile, which means I cheated because um, I have no idea how that happened. Uh, and and uh, so studies in the, in the 25th percentile. But the point being, if you look at this, right? If you were to look at me on paper as a third grader, I looked pretty compromised, right? Um, I, I was clearly really struggling. But what was interesting is that there was never any conversation about that. No, no one ever brought my parents in. No one ever said, hey, it's really weird that in third or fourth grade, Josh is writing this letter to the president and he's using, uh, you know, J-U to try to uh, spell the word change. Um, or, uh, or if we look over at his standardized scores here, um, it's really interesting that he's, he's comprehending way up here, but he's actually reading actual words way down here. But again, none of that was discussed. That was never uh, an option for me. And that last column is um, uh, 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 now actually a picture that's hanging in my dad's uh, uh, my dad's house. He had it framed, but when and I still so clearly remember this. Uh, but when I was in third grade, we had an open house, so you know uh, uh, all all the parents and families come at night to kind of follow your schedule and meet your teachers and whatnot. And I had Miss Ackerman for art class, and for open house, we all had to draw what we wanted to be when we grew up. And I remember so clearly, you know, that open house night, we we walk in the room with my parents, and I'm so proud, and all. All over the art room is displayed everybody's kind of uh, uh, you know dreams and ambitions. Uh, uh, you know, Johnny's going to be a, a lawyer, and somebody else wanted to be a truck driver, and somebody else was a police officer and a doctor. And Miss Ackerman walks up uh, uh, to my parents, and she's got my uh, drawing kind of rolled up, and just hands it to him, and says, "You know, I'm sorry, but I didn't think it was appropriate to display Josh's uh, picture because if you can't tell, that's that's me. That's a self portrait, and I am in my underwear." And coming out of my underwear, that green stuff is uh, money. And in the background, those, those circles are people. Uh, that's the audience. Because when I was in third grade, I wanted to be an exotic dancer. Um, because obviously, I didn't really have an appreciation for what that meant at the time. But I knew you got to wear your underwear and dance. And people gave you money for it. And I thought, what well, could be better than that? Um, and I always joke, too, that, uh, you know, uh, that was also, I, even as early as third grade, I knew I needed a side hustle because school wasn't going to work. Um, and how people looked at that and didn't figure out I was dyslexic, I have no idea. Um, but uh, again, uh, I, I share all that to kind of, again, talk a little bit about what brings me to this work, why I'm so passionate about it, um, and uh, why I think it's so important that we have this, this conversation. Um, I also uh, will highlight for you that this, this kind of uh, tale of two dyslexics, which, right, I know um, uh, I purposely misspelled things there. I, I, you, I often misspell things and I have no clue, but in this case, I actually do. And those are pictures of my two kids, right? Because it turns out, as we'll talk more about as we go through this evening, dyslexia is genetic, right? Um, and so uh, I have two brilliant 
um, uh, highly capable, highly creative, amazing uh, dyslexic children. Um, and what I, I highlight this too, because I have two dyslexic kids that are coming from the same gene pool, being raised in the same environment with the exposure to the same um, kind of academic supports. And yet I have, I have two very different dyslexic kids. Um, and not just by the fact that they're both individuals, but by the way they their, their dyslexia presents itself, right? Um, the, the, the kind of, when we put in an academic setting and, and asked to do certain tasks, again, same genetic pool, both qualify as dyslexic, but the way they represent and uh, the, the opportunities and strengths they bring and also the challenges they bring look very different. My son uh, wasn't uh, diagnosed until late in second grade, um, uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, early second grade, really, really early second grade, but diagnosed because he was actually a really great reader. Um, he, uh, uh, it, or at least seemingly, right? He was, he was getting through, um, beginning, you know, chapter books and whatnot. And he was really, really skilled at knowing what that word was supposed to be, or if he wasn't sure, being able to pick up on enough words to understand what the, what the concept was, right? So, um, it was, uh, uh kind of easy for him to pass, if you will. Um, it is really a spelling that really was a dead giveaway. And it was interesting because when we finally had him formally tested, um, his reading fluency, so the rate at which he reads a text was in like the 99th percentile, but his accuracy, right? His accuracy was in like the 30th percentile. So he would fly through a passage and get most of the words wrong. And yet for the most part, you know, you ask him questions about it and he could, he could figure it out. And then there's my daughter, um, who we uh, diagnosed, uh, you know, we were on it this time um, uh, and diagnosed uh, earlier. And um, again, brilliant um, and a really hard and determined worker, really wants to push through it and do it. But you could you could see, you could watch her read and you could see how labored, um, you know, going, you know, was for her, right? You could, you could just, again, you could see her, um, her brain trying to put this together as she read. So again, I share that to say is one of the things as we go through this evening and we have these conversations, keep in mind that I'm giving a very kind of global generalized view of, 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 of dyslexia, right? But, and it's an umbrella term for which uh, uh, covers a lot of common characteristics. But I always say, if you've seen one dyslexic brain, you've seen one dyslexic brain, because the way in which, um, uh, uh, uh this represents itself, right, in terms of, 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 of how students display it can vary greatly, even though they share this kind of common characteristic, um, what that looks like in, in, in practice and in, in actuality can, can vary from child to child. So I always think that's super important uh, uh, to highlight. So um, what I want to begin, I promise this whole night's not just about me. Um, I promise I will actually move on from personal anecdotes uh, in my family and talk about the science behind all this. But I, I, I had a kind of a couple of revelatory experiences this past summer that I wanted to share because I thought they were a great framework for uh, our, our conversation this evening. So the first is um, over this summer, my family and I had this amazing opportunity where we went on a Disney Mediterranean cruise. Um, it was it was phenomenal. So the picture on the right is actually us this past summer um, at Trevi Fountain. I think I'm saying it right. Trevi Fountain in uh, Rome. Right. Un unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, and I joke, obviously, you could see on the, the left, uh, uh, National Lampoon's European Vacation, because that's how I envisioned this whole experience uh, uh, would be. And also a little, little FYI for you. Um, if you uh, plan on showing your family and your kids uh, uh, National Lampoon's uh, European Vacation, you probably should watch it one more time and not just rely on your recollection from when you were a kid about how great it is, because it turns out uh, our standards have changed in what we find acceptable to show a 10 year old in, you know, 1985 uh, versus now, um, because uh, it was much more uh, racy than I remembered um, from being a kid. But regardless, right, we had this amazing experience. We got to go to Europe uh, and, and it, uh, it was amazing. But I, again, I had this, this revelation while I was there. One of the things that we got to do is before we went on the cruise, we got to go to Paris. And we went to the Louvre, right? And we had a, 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 a with a tour guide at the Louvre. Amazing, really cool. And one of the things that we uh, uh, knew we were going to see that the core doc tour guide kept uh, kind of playing up was the Venus de Milo, right? You know, and I kept saying, kids, oh my God, we're going to see the Venus de Milo. It's one of the most important pieces of art in kind of the Western canon. It's going to be amazing. Um, well, I also, uh, turns out I'm not very cultured because I thought the Venus de Milo was that kind of painting with the woman in the shell and she's doing this and the wind's blowing, right? Um, and that's a different Venus, right? Turns out the Venus de Milo um, is this. The Venus de Milo is a, a statue um, uh, uh, that is kind of uh, held up uh, uh, for a variety of reasons as kind of this 
iconic piece of Western art, right? If you want to know what true beauty, what true Western aesthetic perfection is, it's the Venus de Milo in uh, uh, the Louvre. But what I found fascinating, what, what really the reason I'm sharing this is what I learned from our tour guide is on the left is a picture of the Venus de Milo as we see it today. On the right is how we believe the Venus de Milo would have actually looked um, in its own contemporary times. And obviously what you'll see is not only does she have arms, uh, but she's painted. And in fact, what I learned, what I found so fascinating is that most Roman and Greek statues, again, that, that we kind of herald as, as, as kind of the epitome of, of art and beauty, would have been painted. Um, they would not have been this white marble. Um, this is an example. Of, this is, um, uh, I believe, from uh, uh, depicting something around uh, Alexander the Great, if I remember correctly. Really, the point being the top is how we see it today. The bottom is, is a, a, a kind of a projection of how we think it would have looked. These very bright colors, right? I found this fascinating because when we think about, uh, you know, Greek and Roman statues and we think about this Western um, uh, beauty, we idealize this idea of white marble. But what actually happened was when we first started to uncover these statues, they were covered um, with a, a light pigment. And at first we think that, you know, uh, 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 people thought, okay, that's probably, you know, leftover from some kind of sand or dirt or whatever the case may be. Well, as time went on, we came to understand definitively that that definitely wasn't sand or dirt. These were painted. These were actually painted statues. But we had become so invested in the idea that the white marble was the pinnacle of beauty that, and the idea that they would have been painted, it was so disruptive to, to what we believed and what we held up as, as, as the example of what we all should uh, aspire to be that people were actually, as they discovered it and pulled it out, they would actually right then and there start to rub the color off before they ever even got it you know, um, off the uh, uh, site because it was such a disruptive concept. Right, this, um, the, uh, 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 this is a, from a, a New Yorker article. The idealization of white marble is an aesthetic born of a mistake, right? It's just not true. Uh, I love this. This is, a, a, I believe, a Roman um, vase um, at the Metropolitan M Museum of Art in New York. And what you can see there is we actually have a white statue that's being painted, right? Like, clearly, this happened. And I highlight all this because I found that to just, again, be fascinating, given what I have been raised in, uh, you know, kind of culture to understand. But it also reminds me a lot of our kids. It reminds me a lot of um, how we idealize what school's supposed to look like. We idealize what it means to be smart. We idealize uh, 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 how we measure and uh, uh, understand someone's aptitude and potential. And I would argue again and again that that is all a, a, a an idealization born of a mistake, an idealization um, that is that we perpetuate because we want it to be true, not because it is. And as we go through the evening and we talk a little bit more about um, some of the strengths and struggles associated with dyslexia, I want us to remember that a lot of the struggles, a lot of the deficits, a lot of the um, uh, challenges um, are, are perpetuated or are, are um, uh, made exponentially uh, 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 more difficult because of the way in which we measure kids, right? It's not actually about what a child can do. It's about the way we choose to measure them. And when we do that, we often take these bright, literally figuratively and literally these bright, amazing kids, and we just rub that color right off of them because we're so invested in wanting to believe that we can measure intelligence and we can measure aptitude and we can measure potential in 45 minutes or less, right? And we can do that six times a day um, over the course of 180. Um, uh, so you, you'll hear me say this again throughout, but I, I think it's important to remind everybody that uh, uh, the way we, we uh, uh, think about school as as a uh, training ground or as a, a measuring stick um, is really just false, right? None of us in our lives, in our careers are ever asked to do things the way we're asked to do them in school, right? None of us are given a report card or given a, a, a multiple choice qu uh, test or even given kind of an artificial time period in which to accomplish something like we are in school. Um, so again, I when I learned about that, uh, uh, kind of idealized, you know, originally the color that was then marked away. I, I found that fascinating, I think important to share.
Another revelatory experience from my summer is I went to the Taylor Swift concert. It was amazing. Um, uh, my daughter, Dalloway, and I went and flew to Minneapolis. Um, this is uh, a picture of us. Uh, actually, we got to go with uh, my best friend from college and her daughter, um, who's uh, a senior in high school. Anyway, it was amazing. Um, uh, it was such a, an extraordinary experience, but it got me thinking because um, really the whole conceit behind uh, 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 the idea of this tour um, uh, is uh, uh, that, that, that Taylor Swift at like 34 years old, um, uh, maybe even younger than that, has had a long enough career that she has eras, right? That there are different points in her life that define who she was at that time, right? And that um, uh, uh, she was kind of putting this on display for us. And that really got me thinking, this idea of an era, right? What makes, what mark constitutes a beginning? What constitutes an end? How do we take something and understand it over time? And so what I wanted to do is um, kind of walk you through for a moment, some of the eras of dyslexia. I mean, I, I wanted to give you a, 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 a quick uh, and dirty, uh, uh, quick and dirty uh, history, if you will, of um, uh, dyslexia as to kind of as we understand it today. So in, in my story, in my personal story, this begins in um, I think 1867, maybe 1857, I apologize, in mid 1800s, right? And here we are, and this is a picture of Lake Huron, Lake Heron. I apologize, I say it wrong every time and then I get self-conscious about it, but it's in Michigan. It's not Lake Michigan, but it's a big old lake in Michigan. Um, and I want you to kind of pretend with me for a moment. So it's again, the mid 1800s. It's a one room schoolhouse in, in, in this uh, a small little lake town in Michigan. I like to believe it's February and it's snowing because that makes the whole thing more dramatic. But imagine if you will, for a moment, we're in this one room schoolhouse. Uh, 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 you know, it's uh, the morning and a cold snowy Michigan winter morning and we zoom in and there's a young man of 10 years old sitting at a desk right and he's filled in this the school let's say there's 30 or 40 kids of all different ages and he sits down like he does every day I'm at this little wooden desk uh, uh, to begin uh, uh, to begin his studies and and his teacher comes up to him kind of out of nowhere uh, and comes up to him and pins a note to his jacket and says um, I need you to go home no other explanation, no no uh, reason why, just says, I, I want you to take this note, give it to your mother, and I need you to go home. And I imagine he's confused, he's worried, because um, it's the beginning of the school day. Why is he being sent home? He must assume he's done something wrong, but he doesn't know what. So he walks home, kind of trenching through the snow. He walks into his house. There's his mother, surprised to see him so early. And she pins, or she takes this note, pinned to his jacket. She, she pulls it off, she opens it up, and she reads it. And it says, Dear Mrs. Edison, I am sorry, but Thomas is too stupid to learn. And that is uh, the story of the beginning and the end of Thomas Edison's uh, formal education. Um, and uh, it, it's a true story that, that Thomas Edison was literally written off uh, uh, by uh, his teacher uh, uh, be, as being incompetent, unable to learn. Um, and it was really only because of his mother and his mother's belief uh, in him uh, that he was able to carry on and continue, right? Because we now know today based on on evidence and what we understand about Thomas Edison is that he was likely dyslexic, right? Um, uh, and hence, cast is too stupid to learn uh, uh, in this one room schoolhouse. And obviously went on not only to do amazing things, but to literally change our world. So that's, again, well, that's roughly 1857. And our story then uh, jumps forward. I think we're in like 1898 um, at this point. And in, uh, a, a, so right at the turn of the century, um, in an English medical journal, British medical journal, we have the first documented uh, uh, scientific paper on what at the time was called word blindness. And it was this Dr. Um, uh, Hinshelwood who had come across a family that had uh, multiple siblings, all of whom obviously um, uh, uh, had the same uh, uh, gene pool, right? Same parents, uh, raised in the same environment, all exposed to the same uh, educational opportunities, and a uh, portion of this of this uh, uh, of these siblings, I think it was two or three, 
could not learn to read, despite their other siblings being able to, and these two or three young uh, 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 people being able uh, to, to talk and obviously had uh, you know a, a strong intellect, yet they couldn't learn to read. So Dr. Hinchelwood, again, in the turn of the century, late 1800s, um, uh, uh, de describes this as this concept of word blindness. They could see, but they're blind to words. Right, as early or as um, the late 1800s, we're having this conversation. And then um, I move forward, I think this is 1902, um, maybe uh, 1905. Um, in another British medical journal, we have uh, what is one of the earliest accounts of what we now understand to be ADHD, right? Attention deficit uh, uh, disorder. Um, and there's, this paper talks about uh, these young people who seem to have uh, impulses, um, an inability to uh, uh, contain themselves in, in, you know, in certain circumstances. Um, you can kind of see it's a little blurry, but it actually says, um, you know, these lectures are uh, are concerned of those are uh, are those which are concerned with an, an abnormal defect of moral control in children. Right. Um, uh, being the parent of a child with ADHD, I can sympathize with the idea of uh, uh, a lack of moral control, though I don't actually think that's how uh, we should characterize it or think about it, um, though I can sympathize with it at times. But I'm going to highlight both of these. So here we are in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and we have documentation when we're talking about uh, uh, bright students who are having a difficult time learning to read and bright, fully capable kids who have a difficult time um, uh, regulating their attention. And then we jump forward to the 1920s. In 1920s, we have a neurologist, an MD, uh, a medical doctor, Samuel Orton, who is interested in further understanding kind of the neurobiological reasoning behind this idea of word blindness, right? And then he has partnered with a, a psychologist and a, a practitioner and educator, Anna Gillingham. And she wants to take what he's looking at in the brain and try to figure out how can I apply that to a classroom setting where I can actually um, uh, uh, take this research and turn it into a practice. And out of this relationship, this partnership, we got Orton Gillingham, which remains today one of the most uh, well-known approaches to supporting students with dyslexia. So well-known, in fact, that while Orton Gillingham, there's an academy of Orton Gillingham, which is um, kind of a, a very specific uh, uh, a way of, of approaching things, uh, we now often refer to Orton Gillingham in general as an umbrella term for a direct multi-sensory sequential approach to supporting students uh, uh, with uh, uh, dyslexia and, and related uh, learning differences. We fast forward to, I think this is 1946, uh, a Life Magazine, Life Magazine in 1946 does a, a cover spread on dyslexia. This is actually the picture from the magazine itself. And in it, in this issue, in the mid 1940s, Life Magazine actually says, we can likely attribute a high percentage of the uh, of individuals who go on not to complete their formal schooling. We can, we can attribute a lot of that to undiagnosed and unsupported dyslexia. In the mid 1940s, we're having this conversation, right? Um, obviously, just by looking at this picture, um, we know that uh, we, there were still a lot of misconceptions because this suggests that dyslexia is a visual-based uh, 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 difficulty, which we know it's not. Uh, but uh, 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 we now know it's not. But again, the point being, we started in 18, uh, you know, around 1857. Here we are 100 years later, um, approximately in 1946, and Life magazine is telling us, hey, there's this thing called dyslexia that we should be looking at in our schools. Um, fast forward to 1971, um, uh, a, a Harvard uh, a graduate, a, a former theologian, a, a, a eccentric genius of an educator, um, Dr. Charles Drake, starts a school um, outside of, of uh, Beverly, Massachusetts, I'm sorry, in Beverly, Massachusetts, where he wants to take the research that he uh, uh, was exposed to at Harvard and, and apply it in a school setting to actually create a school based on the research um, that was coming out around dyslexia and learning differences. And he starts uh, the Landmark School. Uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, kind of anecdotes about Dr. Drake, who I never had the uh, honor to meet. Um, so we have this gentleman, right? Again, went to Harvard. He's, he's, he's a, a, an eccentric genius, um, but he's also very dyslexic. And we actually have a, a, a school nurse uh, right now uh, uh, at Landmark who uh, was a former student and knew Dr. Drake. 
And uh, he said that, uh, you know, he was here and he's relatively young. He was like 10 years old. And uh, he would run into Dr. Drake uh, and have to help him or have to highlight for him that he had his uh, shoes on the wrong foot, right? So Dr. Drake would uh, put his left with his right. Uh, and I just think it's hysterical. This 10-year-old had to highlight that for him. Um, but again, that's uh, kind of uh, all part of this story, right? Um, then we're going to fast forward again. Um, uh, somewhere around the 1980s, early 1990s, um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Galaberta, a Harvard researcher, really wants to help uh, bring to a conclusion this idea of whether or not dyslexia is neurobiological, right? Is it of the brain? Um, all the research was suggesting it was. He knew it had to be. And so he started a research project where he actually um, uh, uh, took uh, uh, the uh, brains of, of, of individuals who had passed away uh, uh, and did an autopsy of their brain, these individuals who um, uh, were believed to be dyslexic and actually were eight, was able to identify definitively the, bio, the neurobiological differences that represent themselves in the brain of those. Um, who are or are believed to be dyslexic, right? So we were able to eradicate any um, misconception around, oh, this is uh, an environmental uh, uh, situation, or this comes from this, or this comes from that. All of that was put to rest um, because, uh, again, as early, um, or as long ago as, as the late 80s, early 90s, thanks to uh, Dr. Galaberta, we were able to confirm that dyslexia was neurobiological. Right. And then uh, uh, in, in 2000, I believe it was 2001. Right. So almost 60 years after Life magazine's uh, coverage of uh, 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 dyslexia, Time magazine um, does a, a full spread uh, in response to um, Sally Shaywitz's kind of uh, seminal work overcoming dyslexia, where uh, Dr. Shaywitz and her husband profiled um, uh, this neurobiological organs of dyslexia, what this means, what this looks like, by looking at um, uh, uh, individuals, young people who had average to above average IQs, and yet were having this unexpected difficulty uh, learning to read, write, and spell. And again, what I find fascinating about this is that we have this kind of, uh, uh, from 1946 to 2001, almost 60 years, and we're running the exact same story all over again, uh, uh, which I find fascinating and depressing all at the same time. Um, and then we get to kind of the aughts, right? Um, early 2000s. And what we are now uh, in a place where uh, thanks to work happening, you know, really just down the road from us now at Harvard and MIT and at Tufts University, we're able to actually start to identify an uh, 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 dyslexia um, in utero almost, right? Um, uh, 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 in certain circumstances, we're actually able uh, to look at developing brains and with some level of confidence predict um, whether or not they're going to develop to be uh, uh, individuals um, uh, with dyslexia or related language-based learning differences, right? The idea, again, of this, this story arc being that we have so much information and we've had it for so long, and yet, and yet, we still sit here today with thousands of kids uh, uh, not being served. Um, so now I'm going to shift our story a little bit to bring us up to, to, to today, right? So to where we sit today, I'm going to show you a video. I'm hoping the sound comes through. Um, we've had a little bit of difficulty with this, but I'm going to show you this video that kind of um, uh, uh, brings you to how um, uh, uh, we're thinking about it today. Actually, I'm going to give you this slide first, right? Um, and, uh, uh, which is, oh, you know what? I'm not going to show you a video. Sorry, I'm not, but I'm going to later. Uh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so right before we get to the era of where we are now, right, um, uh, going back from 1890, uh, 1856 to where we are today, what have we learned? And then I'll encapsulate in this video that I'll show you in just a bit of uh, uh, where we sit today. So one thing, this is a, a, a quote from uh, Dr. Gordon Sherman, who's a, uh, a former chair of the International Dyslexia Association and a Harvard neurologist, um, just uh, did incredible and important work. And he's got this great quote that says, it is not a disability if you do not have what the environment does not want. And I joke because every time I read that, I feel like I have a disability. Um, it is not a disability if you do not have what the environment does not want. And so what, what he means by that is an example I use is when I was in school, I, I hated school, but I loved to learn. And I saw those as two very different things. Um, but when I, I use the example of if I was in school, if the environment um, uh, appreciated this, right, if the environment valued this, the idea of learning, 
right? Then I would have been like this, right? I would have been like a god uh, among men, right? But instead, um, I was in an environment that valued this, right? Nothing wrong with that, but I was not a sports guy whatsoever. Um, way too awkward for that. Um, and because my environment valued this, I was this, right? I was, I was a nerd. Um, I was a big nerd. And so I highlight to say that before this, before Gutenberg and the printing press, uh, uh, before this idea that we could take ideas and subscribe them and capture them in symbols that represented sounds and that we could we could provide that uh, to the masses, right? So before Gutenberg and the printing press, there was no dyslexia, right? The concept of dyslexia did not exist. The neurobiological underpinnings did. We know that, right? We know without question that the 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 kind of the, the makeup of of brains and have, as they kind of exist today, as we understand dyslexia, those same brains existed before the printing press, but they were not in an environment that demanded certain attributes or certain uh, 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 skills or tasks, and therefore uh, uh, the the difficulties associated were not were not present, right? Didn't exist, right? So. I, I highlight that to say that um, dyslexia is a learning disability, uh, 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 I, especially when put into an environment where it's not recognized, understood, or appropriately supported. But I also would highlight it's an environmental disability, right? Um, many of our kids, where they might struggle in language arts class, or they might struggle throughout the school day when you put them in the art studio, or you put them on the baseball field, or you put them on the stage, or, what, or you give them a set of Legos, whatever it is, suddenly that disability doesn't exist in the same way, right? Because the environment is asking different things. I would further argue that it's dyslexia is a school-based disability, right? Uh, we know that when we give kids appropriate support, we give them appropriate instruction, that we can help them make progress. And so often the disability is really more based on the environment that they're in, right? The school's lack of understanding. Um, and what I also, as we go through this, I want to make an argument about is that dyslexia is actually or can be with the right opportunities a valued difference. Um, and that's really kind of the, uh, the evolution of this story arc, right? Um, that when given the appropriate support and given the appropriate opportunity and the appropriate privileges, that um, dyslexia can actually be a, uh, a valued difference. Um, and that's what we're going to, uh, again, look at uh, tonight. So this is something from um, the uh, uh, book, The Dyslexic Advantage by the Doctors E.D. I highly recommend it. It's a really fascinating book. It's very accessible to help you better understand kind of the, uh, the biology around dyslexia, but also um, uh, some of the strengths often associated with people with dyslexia. And they have this quote, when it comes to learning, there is no good or bad, right or wrong, only a difference in style, which should be fostered rather than corrected. And I think that's a really important point to make here, right? Um, as we as we dig a little bit more into why students might struggle uh, uh, with uh, reading, writing, and spelling, this is not about, about fixing anybody, right? This is not about a, a default that needs to be corrected. It's about understanding how kids process information and how can we maximize that. Um, so again, it's, it's not about fixing, um, it's about fostering, uh, which again, I think is, a, is, a, is a, an important mind shift for many of us. So I'm going to throw this up here. Um, uh, and then I'm going to say, oh, no, look at that. Look at that. Right. Um, uh, yeah. See, look at you. Look at you all. Um, uh, despite the fact that I said, please, chances are you all read that, but suddenly, right. Suddenly, uh, I threw up, uh, uh, what I believe to be an Arabic symbol and chances are the vast majority of you have no recognition or appreciation for that. And I, I highlight all this to say what happens is over time, um, we, we, reading becomes an almost involuntary act for many of us, right? Um, our brains come to associate so strongly that symbol with a sound and combine those sounds to gain meaning that, again, it almost seems effortless. It's not, and that's what we're about to get into. Um, but I, 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 I highlight to say that it's also somewhat contextual, right? Because when I give you symbols for which you have no connotation, for which you, you don't have an association, suddenly everything turns right off, right? And I, I highlight that to say that reading is a manufactured process. While, again, it feels like it's an 
involuntary act. It feels like a very natural act for us that have uh, become fluent readers. It's it's a hundred percent artificial and manufactured. So I think now I'm going to show you a video. It wasn't the original video I was talking about. We'll still get to that. Um, but this is a video uh, that um, talks us about what is reading, right? What are we talking about? Because to understand um, uh, dyslexia, I think it's important to first understand what is reading. So I'm going to show you that I've had a little bit of trouble with my sound today, but hopefully this is going to come through with you. It's about a two or three minute video that walks you through um, what is reading. Talk about reading. I think I think many people don't have an appreciation for how complex this really is. You know, many of us don't understand that that while we were put on this earth to to see and and to talk and to hear, we weren't put here to read. Reading is not a natural act. There's not one part of our brain that controls it. It's actually many different things coming together at once to create a reader. And when you look back to the creation of reading 2,000 years ago, it was actually a new technology, ju just like anything else. In fact, like many new technologies, reading was actually quite controversial. Socrates himself believed that reading was going to be the end of modern civilization. You see, you have to understand that during Socrates' time, a person's intellect was judged by their ability to memorize long passages and then recite them from memory. So the concept of reading was an affront to their system for understanding who was smart and who was dumb. Now, fast forward 2,000 years later to the present time, and we now use a system of intelligence where we ask people to take 26 symbols, translate them into 40 speech sounds that have over 250 representations, and we use that process to decide who's smart and who's dumb. But not only that, we ask folks to do it instantaneously. And despite the fact that it took us 2,000 years to develop it, we ask our students to master it in less than 2,000 days. And if they don't, we blame the child and not the sister. And because it's so complex and, and it's so high stakes that students are able to do this, I think it's really important that we take a step back and look at our brain on reading. So let's take the word cat. When I come across the word cat, lots of things come together at once in order for me to be able to read it or decode it. The first thing I do is take that symbol C. That C goes into my brain and I try to find a mental image you can match it with. Once I do that, I then take that symbol and I try to figure out where it is in the word and the symbols around it to help create a sound association. Once I have that sound association, I then look at the next symbol and again, bring it into my brain, try to map it to a mental image that already exists, assign it a sound based on the sound that came before it, and so on and so forth, until I get to C-A-T as t a t Now that I've decoded the word, I have to instantaneously go through a series of tasks associated with language processing. I have to take that word cat, assign it a definition. What does the word cat mean? That definition is also informed by my own background knowledge. What are my experiences with cat, and how does that inform my understanding of this word? At the same time, I have to figure out the syntax. Is the cat performing the action or is the action being performed upon the cat? And even still, I have to stop and think, is the cat part of a larger thought? Is it an inference or a metaphor? All of these things, along with my decoding tasks, come to form comprehension. And it doesn't matter if I've been reading for 10 days or 10 years. My brain always has to work through the same tasks. So the next time you pick up a book and you see that word cat, take a moment to appreciate the miracle that is reading. So I highlight that, I show you that, because if you take nothing away from this evening, nothing else, I want you to think about and remember how complex reading really is. Um, there's kind of a, 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 a famous phrase, I think it was Dr. Louisa Motes, that said reading really is rocket science. And it's true. Just by looking at all that, that description, all those things that our brains have to do, it's remarkable that more people don't have a difficult time with reading. And the other thing I really want to highlight from that is that, again, this idea that reading is artificial. We weren't put here to do it, right? It's, it's not a natural act. We take other parts of our brain that were originally 
originally designed evolutionarily uh, to, to do something else. And we, we over time assign them uh, uh, to take these little squiggly lines and figure out how to associate them with sounds and find meaning out of that. Um, real quick, I just want to show you this uh, 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 visual. That top uh, row there, what you see is um, kind of brain activity as someone becomes a reader. So obviously a kindergartner, when they're first being exposed uh, to letters, there's not a whole lot of activity because they may not yet know to find meaning or purpose in it, right? So um, when young kids, when they first start to see letters, they don't automatically think, oh my gosh, that's important. They learn through our direct instruction and also through our own obser through observations of our own behaviors. Oh, these things have some importance, which is why you'll see by second grade that, that we see a lot more activity. Those, those darker colors to show the level of, of activity, but also the breadth of it, right? It's happening all over the brain. And then I, I always find this fascinating, though it makes sense. By the time that we become adults, right, for most typical readers, um, because we are beginning so much better at reading, we become so much more efficient. Um, so we actually have less brain activity required because we've built this network of shortcuts and highways that our brain can come together and, and make these uh, instant connections. But what we find for individuals with dyslexia and related language-based learning differences is those highways and those shortcuts are not nearly as um, well-paved, as effective, as um, direct as they are with a traditional reader. Um, and so what I show is my favorite thing in the world. Um, this is a uh, illustration of uh, uh, Scarborough, Dr. Scarborough's rope. Um, and this is, uh, uh, she went through and wanted to highlight for everyone you know, what are all the pieces that have to come together in order for us to be a skilled reader? And you see there on the right-hand side, a skilled reader is somebody who not only can understand what they read, but they can do it at a rate um, that's fluent, right? They, they're able to read this at an expected rate and understand what they're reading. And if you back out from that, what you see are these two ropes that actually are made up of all these tiny strands. And all those different strands represent a task that our brain must go through when we come across a word, right? Going back to that animation, right? Not only do we have to go, at, right? We have to do all this language work associated with it as well. And so we break it down in this particular illustration into two kind of spheres, if you will, will language and word recognition or phonological uh, processing. Language, right, are all these different pieces where we have to take what we're seeing and find meaning in it, right? And there's, all, again, all these things uh, that uh, uh, <clears throat> attribute whether or not we understand something. Interestingly, when we look at comprehension, when we look at whether or not a child's going to understand a passage, their number one indicator of whether or not they're going to understand it is background knowledge. So it's not that surprising, but if I know a lot about space or I have a high level of interest in space and I read a passage about it, I am likely to have a much higher uh, uh, comprehension rate than somebody who doesn't know a lot or doesn't have a lot of interest in space. Um, so uh, uh, same like, for instance, right now, if I were to be given a graduate level or uh, a text on dyslexia, I could probably make my way through it, right? There might be some words and some concepts that are difficult for me, but I would probably be able to comprehend it better than your average person. At the same time, if you give me a physics textbook, uh, even on an eighth grade level, I would be absolutely lost, right? And it's really not a reflection of my intellect or ability. It's a reflection of my background knowledge. And that falls under, to some degree, that language piece, right? Um, what's our vocabulary understanding? Um, all those things. Then at the bottom here, that word recognition, that has a lot to do with us being able to instantaneously associate symbols with sounds. And when we talk about dyslexia, that's kind of classic dyslexia is at the bottom there, right? That 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 difficulty associating that that kind of curved symbol with a k, right? And not only that, making sure that it actually says k in that particular context, because if it's you know uh, 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 associated with another letter or at a different part of the word, it might make a totally different sound. This is also where we see retrieval, um, word retrieval. So we often see with students with dyslexia a difficult time retrieving sight words, the, was, it, were. Words that we're not actually supposed to decode, we just have to know, and we have to know them instantly. And often what we'll find is students with uh, dyslexia uh, are inconsistent, right? So one day they know the, and the next, like they've never seen it before, and you as a parent want to lose your mind, right? Because you've just been sitting there doing hours of flashcards, and suddenly it's like they've never seen it before. 
right? Um, that's that's what that retrieval piece goes into, and that phonological awareness and decoding, right? Or that is that more that ability to break words into sounds, right? And to be able to manipulate sounds. Um, so we talk about the that word recognition. That bottom part is kind of classic dyslexia, but it's almost more common for kids to have a spectrum of of challenges across this, right? They're they're uh, most Prominent might be the decoding piece, the sound piece, but it's not uncommon at all for them to also have some difficulties up on the language piece. It also makes a lot of sense that if I'm in fourth or fifth grade and I'm still having a difficult time decoding words, chances are I've lost out on some background knowledge. Because in science class, I'm not really available to listen and to learn because I'm spending so much time trying to just get through reading that word aloud. Um, so again, complexities of reading. So if we know, if we have a better understanding of reading, what is what is dyslexia in all this? So this is the um, uh, uh, International Dyslexia Association's uh, a definition, which is probably the most cited. Um, uh, and it talks about its neurobiological and origin, which we've all, uh, already discussed. It's characterized by uh, uh, a difficulty with accurate or fluent word recognition, that retrieval piece, spelling and decoding. Decoding is sounding out words. I think we're all familiar with spelling. And there's actually a huge uh, correlation between re reading and spelling, right? So um, when we talk about helping a student that's struggling, we really need to not only just be teaching them reading, we need to be teaching them reading within the context of spelling because it's the back and forth, right? Here's how this, here's how that sound is represented. Here's how you represent that sound, right? And that kind of helps solidify for the brain that back and forth. What I have highlighted and underlined here is the word unexpected. And the idea being that we are surprised that these kids are having a hard time. Um, and that to me is part of the most important part here, right? These are, are bright, capable kids and we are surprised that they're having a difficult time. This has also understandably become a controversial uh, uh, piece of, of this definition because sometimes um, in the larger field or in schools in general, um, we decide that we're not surprised that a child's not learning to read, right? Oh, well, it's because they're poor or it's because they go to a bad school or it's because they have, uh, you know, their, uh, English isn't their native language, right? And we attribute all these things where we know the vast majority of kids should be able to learn to read. Um, so anytime a child is having a difficult time learning to read, it should be unexpected, right? The, the, the exceptions being if we know a child has an intellectual disability or um, a, a fairly severe uh, traumatic brain injury that would prevent them from being able to read. Otherwise, it should be unexpected um, regardless of, of their circumstance or consequence. Um, uh, but I'm going off on a bit of a tangent there. But again, the idea being that we have kiddos who are bright, who are capable, um, uh, and especially when we know that we can eliminate the idea of not having the appropriate instruction, right? We're surprised why they're having a difficult time. So why? Why, why is this happening in the first place? Well, um, uh, what we find is that reading is actually about mapping. It's actually about our brain great creating these highways um, uh, uh, that, again, were these different parts that were originally create, uh, created for a different purpose. We have to make all these connections. And what you can see in this visual on the right, those um, kind of circles or ovals, those are kind of, think of those are centers of brain activity, and then they have to connect with each other. So there's not a, one single part of our brain that is a, we attribute to reading. There's many parts. It's creating a map. What you'll see here is a picture of a, uh, a non-dyslexic brain and a dyslexic brain, an illustration of what it looks like on reading. And really the takeaway I want you to see here is that most traditional readers, their brains follow a fairly similar path where it's largely on the left hemisphere um, where we're seeing activity and we're seeing this kind of map being made. For dyslexic learners, for LBLD learners, what we find is that they don't follow the same pathways. This, um, I, what I don't appreciate about this illustration is it implies that dyslexic people do it one way, non-dyslexic do another. And that's not really it. The idea is traditional readers, non-dyslexics largely do it one way. Dyslexic people are doing it all kinds of ways. Um, we're doing whatever it is we can uh, to try to make this work. So it's not like there's two maps. There's a traditional map. And then there's what I like to call the fun map, right? We're going to get there the fun way. Uh, but that can look very, very different. And it tends to be inefficient. Uh, when we think about how we process uh, language and especially how we process uh, connecting sounds and symbols, it's 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 fairly uh, inefficient. And again, we know that's because of the way the brain um, uh, was developed, right? Not, not because of any environmental reason or any kind of um, kind of 
uh, a post utero incident, right? Um, it's just a different way of processing information. I, I tie it to this idea of uh, uh, when I was in seventh grade, um, social studies, and we had the age of explorers. So you, have, uh, you might remember this time where we talked about uh, these Western explorers wanted to find a, a shortcut to the uh, uh, spice route, right? They wanted to get to Asia to access that trade route, but they didn't want to go all the way down Africa uh, uh, because it was such a dangerous and long route. So what they started to do is what if we, instead of going down, what if we went what if we went left, right? What if we went this way? And there was this belief that they would find a Northwest Passage. When they found, uh, uh, or when they first themselves came upon uh, uh, what is we now understand to be North America, there was this belief that there's got to be a shortcut through this, this Northwest Passage. And by going that way, we'll access the spice trade so much quicker. Um, and obviously there wasn't, right? It was actually a terrible way if speed uh, was your was your goal because uh, it, it was very inefficient. But at the same time, I always say, think about all that was discovered because of that. We found lakes, we found rivers, we found valleys, we found mountains, right? We discovered all of these things uh, that, uh, that, that at least the Western world did not know existed because we went a different way. Um, and I, I, th I think a lot about that construct when we think about dyslexia. Well, it certainly processing information differently can be a, uh, a handicap. It can be a disability in certain circumstances without question. It could also be an opportunity when you see the world differently. I, I, I firmly believe that when, when you go left and the rest of the world, world goes right, there can be something to that. To further illustrate this, and I know I'm running uh, low on time, but we started five minutes late, so I'm going to give myself another six. Um, but I want to show this is a, a picture of a face, right? We all see it as a face, but what we're actually seeing is this, right? So when we first see it, we don't realize our, our brain is so predisposed to faces. That is something we are we are we are evolutionary, biologically predisposed, as we we know to make a face a face that we will turn this right and we will make it seem like a we will not see the the arrow in it because we're so uh hardwired to see faces same thing here right i show you these faces chances are you don't have any um, any reaction to them whatsoever there's no kind of instinctual response i show you this face good battery in between doesn't matter chances are you have a response because you've been kind of engineered over time to associate this with something well <clears throat> the same thing happens right with these letters but remember when we saw that face forward or backwards up or down deformed or not we knew that to be a face well with letters it's the exact opposite um depending on their orientation that makes you a huge implication right for how we're supposed to understand it what sound we're supposed to uh, attribute to it and interestingly the part of our brain that and understands that as a P or a D or a B instantly is the same part of our brain that was originally used to uh, identify faces. So when we talk about how, um, oh, dyslexics see letters backwards or it's a visual problem, it's not about that at all. It's about our brain trying to process using a part of, the, using a part of it that wasn't originally for this purpose. And it's the idea of kind of breaking our own rule, right? As we develop as young people, as, as, as infants and into toddlers, we, we are, it's driven home to us that uh, a chair is a chair is a chair, whether it's up, down, on its side, whatever the case may be. But then we get to letters and none of that is true, right? So when kids do reversals or um, they seem to confuse letters, it's not because they don't see them correctly. It's that their brain isn't processing them efficiently and effectively as we'd want them to. All right. So now, now I want to get to my video. Right. So what is what does this all look like today? What if, uh, what about dyslexia in the story arc of where we are? And now I think I'm going to show you. I am. I'm going to show you this video. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but I think this introduces the era that we're entering right now. I think this video originally came out in 2019, if I remember correctly. Um, but I'll just give you a it is preview. estimated that over 6 million people in the UK have dyslexia. Defined as a learning difficulty, many people refer to as a hidden disability. It wasn't great for self-esteem. I felt stupid and I felt less than other people. It didn't like that feeling. A current perception of the word dyslexia is definitely stuck in an outdated narrative. This negative perception is incredibly damaging in the workplace. And it's an injustice because so many people with dyslexia have gone on to be amazingly successful.
our research found. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, go past it. That's a video you can find on mainbodyslexia.org. It's great. But if you didn't know, on your LinkedIn profile, you can actually put dyslexic thinking as an attribute, as a skill. So going all the way back to 1857, right, and uh, uh, Thomas Edison being told he's too stupid to learn to today, being able to add dyslexic thinking as a skill on your LinkedIn profile, to me, is just amazing. And what we're coming to understand is that a lot of individuals that um, uh, are dyslexic when we, we talk to them about, you know, where is it that you find your strengths? Where is it that you find uh, that you, uh, you know, have talents? They're often kind of uh, grouped into these, these characteristics, right? Dyslexic people often are very good communicators, right? They're very good at storytelling. They're very good at taking complex ideas and, and communicating them in ways that people understand. Um, often they're very imaginative. Um, uh, the, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs are dyslexic. A lot of uh, creative thinkers are dyslexic artists. Um, a lot of dyslexic thinkers tend to be very visual. Um, again, think about our, you know, a lot of our kids um, are really good at Legos, building things. I have to say this is where I feel very non-dyslexic because I'm terrible at this, right? I, I, I envy anyone. I, I couldn't put together um, a cardboard box, but a lot of people um, who are dyslexic, that's actually something that, that makes a lot of sense to them. Um, dyslexics are often explorers. Again, I mentioned entrepreneurs, a lot of CEOs, um, a disproportionate amount we find to be are dyslexic and ADHD, right? Uh, 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 dyslexic people are often um, will uh, kind of cut against the grain. Again, there's something about seeing the world different. There's something about going left when everyone else goes right. Um, a lot of dyslexic people um, are people people, right? They they're, they're, they they um, uh, can make connections. We actually know um, uh, uh, through work through the University of California in San Francisco that um, uh, dyslexic people have a disproportionately high level of empathy. And we a whole other conversation as to why, um, why that might be. But we actually know um, that uh, uh, dyslexic people have, have higher levels of empathy. Which is also why um, we we also often see higher levels of anxiety in uh, individuals with dyslexia, right? Um, I, arguably because of that <clears throat> higher levels of empathy, and also um, I, I would argue often because of being in a school environment that's not built for them, where they're spending their entire day and really their entire existence for those first, you know, uh, uh, formative years trying to navigate and figure this this out. Um, uh, we also know that many dyslexic people have really high reasoning skills, right? So. An example I use is we might, um, uh, some dyslexic uh, individuals, um, you know, they might have a hard time with uh, three times three is nine, just pulling that out. Um, that retrieval piece, just like the word the, right, can be, uh, take them a second to get to. The same idea with a math fact. And yet they're amazing at the concepts and the application of math. Right, they can do all the problem, but then they get counted off wrong because of an addition error or a multiplication error, not because of a process error. Right, so we're really good at reasoning. Again, that is not my dyslexic strength by any means. But what is important, I think, fascinating about this is that these skills are also line up um, uh, perfectly with what uh, uh, the global World Economic Forum and other kind of entities are are casting as the most in-demand skills of the future workforce. So through technology and automation and uh, really just the way our world is changing, these very skills, the ones we just highlighted, they're often associated with individual dyslexia, are kind of over-indexed in the workplace of the future. Um, so with this concept of the fourth industrial revolution that with AI and other advances of technology, we're going into a new age, right? Um, uh, what we're calling the learning age. And that's this idea that uh, uh, the workforce of the future is gonna ask us to adapt, right? It's not about what you know, it's about what you can learn because things are going to change so rapidly that your ability to learn is going to be more important. And we talk a lot about dyslexia as a learning disability, um, but again, as we know, it's an environmental uh, uh, disability in that sense. Um, and I would argue any kid that can get through uh, uh, 12 years of formal ed education, um, uh, especially undiagnosed and unsupported, knows a heck of a lot about learning what actually matters and how to navigate complex and difficult situations. Um, I'm going to... Uh, skip that for a second again in the interest of time. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. That fir first one I skipped, again, another Made by Dyslexia uh, uh, org video. And then following that was an interview I did with Dr. Chris Didi, who's a, one of the world's leading experts in AI and education. And again, what we're finding is with the, with with so much more uh, of, of, kind of the workforce and uh, kind of ration, rations, rational skills 
being automated through AI, these softer skills that are associated with dyslexia are becoming more and more valued. Um, this, I believe, is from the World Economic Forum. And this, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is McKinsey. Um, uh, this is a kind of a prediction of what might happen by 2030 in the workforce as AI and other technologies come to bear. And essentially what it suggests is that so many more things are going to become um, automated. And that I think it's what um, up to 30 uh, Thirty percent of our our kind of time spent on job right now, um, on average, might end up being uh, automated, uh, and you can see these different industries and what that that means. All this is uh, kind of building up to the suggestion that we're actually entering a new era where the very skills uh, and talents that are often associated with dyslexia are going to be the very skills and talents that we need to navigate uh, this new and incredibly complex uh, world. So uh, I, we used to talk about when I first got into educational career that our kids were going to have jobs that don't yet exist. And that, you know, turned out true. Um, when I first started education, you know, web designer was not something that we talked about, let alone, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an influencer or um, a SEO or whatever it is, uh, optimizer on your website. None of those jobs existed. And now I think we're entering an age where not only are kids going to have jobs that don't yet exist, they're going to do jobs that exist today, but in very different ways than we do them right now. Um, and again, I think um, our kids are dyslexic students who often are put in a situation where the environment exasperates their deficits. I actually think um, if we can get them through that appropriately, their brains are built for this uh, uh, brave uh, new world. This is a report from EY um, that again um, highlights this. What are, the, what are the skills uh, that are in decline? What are the skills that are on the rise? And you'll find, again, this overlap um, often between what employers um, are increasingly demanding and what many dyslexic people self-identify as saying, you know, that's something I'm really good at. Um, uh, uh, which, again, a uh, fascinating time that we're living in and fascinating things to come forward. So um, kind of in conclusion, I would argue that as we go into the fourth industrial revolution, uh, we're actually entering the dyslexic age, right? That if we if we can give our kids the appropriate supports that they need while they are in school, we, we are positioning them to inherit immense opportunities because for the very reasons they have a difficult time in certain academic tasks, that same difference in processing um, uh, could also result in them in being novel and uniquely situated to solve the ever-changing complex and interconnected problems of, of the future. And it's our responsibility to give them what they need now so that they can inherit that uh, opportunity uh, in the future. And honestly, we're all just gonna need them to do it anyway um, because the world's problems are way too complex uh, to uh, uh, sideline uh, any of our brightest thinkers and doers. Uh, so I went through that very, very quickly. There's so much I did not cover and I apologize. Um, but if you have any questions and you have the time to stay on, please do and put them in the chat. Um, I know I have one already um, about uh, uh, somebody asked about how I talk very quickly, and I do, I apologize. Um, but that their daughter, who's also dyslexic, um, struggles with rapid responses um, and pulling her thoughts together. Um, and you ask about what is double dyslexia, um, right? So again, think about this idea of dyslexia exists on a spectrum, right? Uh, 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 so how it represents itself can look very different. Um, so there's something called um, uh, double deficit, uh, uh, which I, again, I don't love, but that's the idea. And the double deficit, what, what we look, we're referring to is when we look at a child's um, scores and you know how we, we diagnose and come to an understanding of qualifying them as dyslexic, one thing we look at is phonological processing. Um, their ability to manipulate sounds. So as an example, um, very simplified version, sometimes we'll, uh, depending on the child's age, we'll do things like say, say cowboy. Now say cowboy, but don't say boy, right? Or say pat. What's the first sound in pat? If you were to drop the p sound in pat, what do you have? That's about manipulating sounds, right? And segmenting and isolating sounds. A lot of students have difficulties with that. We also look at rapid automatic naming or RAN, and that's the ability to just very quickly name things. Um, so one of the, a key indicator of whether or not a child might uh, uh, go on to have a difficult time with reading is uh, their ability to rapidly name colors. So if we know they're not colorblind, um, how rapidly can they name colors you know, in terms of an age appropriate way? And children have a hard time doing that, right? Um, might have a, a lower RAN score, right? So. Uh, you, you, some folks that we qualify as dyslexic, their sound manipulation 
is not as, as compromised as we would think, but they have a really hard time with the retrieval piece. Um, uh, sometimes we have uh, what we've again double deficit hypothesis is that we have kiddos that uh, might struggle with both. <clears throat> Important thing highlighting: neither of these things have anything to do with intelligence. They all have to do with speed, which is not intelligence. So I think that's the uh, the difference uh, 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 there. Um, uh, if that if that's helpful. Um, uh, asked about, you know, what would be uh, uh, the appropriate support speed. So ultimately, we want to do is we want to get kiddos ex uh, explicit, multi-sensory, systematic instruction. Um, right now, the, the term that's often used is structured literacy. So we have kind of the science of reading, which is how we understand the, the brain to become a reader, what, what's required. Structured literacy is what that looks like in a classroom. Um, and uh, uh, it really addresses all those things on the rope. Um, oftentimes you'll hear it referred to as Orton Gillingham. Orton Gillingham's great. It's amazing. Um, but it doesn't have to be Orton Gillingham. But what we do want is a structured literacy approach where we're, we break down language into its most uh, uh, core components and then directly introduce them to kids. Uh, and that structured literacy approach is actually ideal for all kids, um, dyslexic or not. Uh, the difference is if you're dyslexic, you're going to need more of it. If you're just a traditional reader, you know, uh, in you know kindergarten, first, second grade, structured literacy is still great for you. You're just going to get it pretty quickly, whereas a dyslexic learner is going to need um, some more explicit support. Um, how can uh, parents support kids with dyslexia at home? Great question. I think um, one thing we can do is uh, I think uh, <clears throat> the social emotional piece is so important, right? We can help you figure out how to learn to read. If you stop believing in yourself, that's a lot harder thing to build back. So I think making sure at home that we are talking about effort, that we're talking about applying ourselves, that we're highlighting uh, uh, the areas and finding just as much importance in what we're good at as, versus what we struggle with, versus um, really having conversations about grades. Oh, your grade's not great. Or you didn't, you know, this, this handwriting is so sloppy or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's out of their control. What's in their control is the effort that they put forward and then also making sure we balance that with talents. Now, if the talent is, is playing video games at, you know, with appropriate limitations, that's okay, right? Look, um, let's do that. We also want to make sure at home that um, uh, we if we need to get them extra support through tutoring and things like that, that's super important. And I, we got to figure out a way, how can we do that without sacrificing baseball or basketball or soccer or what or dance or whatever it is they like to do um because they we've got to create opportunities for them to find success the other thing i will say is um uh we want it's so great to read to our kids no matter what their age are ages because with most dyslexic kids they can comprehend here but they can read or decode here. So if we only rely on what they can decode independently as their reading experience, they're often going to be bored and they're going to miss out on background knowledge, right? So it is, is perfectly acceptable and, and in fact important to read to our kids and, and to also introduce audiobooks for our kids who are older and they're not going to um they're not going to uh uh, 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 necessarily think it's cool for mom or dad to read to them out loud anymore. We can introduce audiobooks. What I would would suggest is that we don't make that the solution. We make that a piece of a solution as we build up those skills. Um, connection between working memory and dyslexia, such a great question. And that kind of goes back to that earlier one around, I talk so fast, right? I talk really fast uh, because uh, I, I arguably have uh, relatively high verbal processing speed, but my working memory is terrible. And those are those both have to do with speed, but they're different things. So working memory is the ability to take information into short-term memory. And by short-term, I don't mean like today, I mean seconds. Um, but hold on to information in short-term memory, do something uh, with it, and then have an output. So as an example, one way that it's sometimes tested is we give kids a, a series of letters and numbers, ask them to read them back to us. Then we give them a series of letters and numbers, and this time we ask them to read them back to us, but do it in alphabetical and numerical order. So now I have to hold on to this information, and I have to do something with it, and then put it back out. Um, that's an example of working memory. And a lot of kids with dyslexia have relatively low working memory. It could still be in the average range, but the rest of their of uh, their in, uh, kind of the way that we measure their intellect, their verbal processing, their reasoning skills 
are are well above it so they can they can think and do more than they can push through if that makes sense i always give this example i never feel more dyslexic than when i have to pack um i'm actually going on a trip tomorrow night and it's and i hate packing because i have to hold in my med okay how many days are going what do i need each day um uh and you know socks shoes uh uh you know brown belt black belt well this night we're dressing up and it's going to be cold i have to hold on to all these things and i have to execute upon that uh, and it just drives me insane. So that's that idea of working memory. It's why in the classroom, what we'll see is when we give kids only verbal instructions, I want you to get your blue folder out. I want you to get your red pen. And then I want you to write your name on the top left-hand corner. If that's if we're only giving that to them orally, that's actually a lot for them to hold on to. Or at home, when we say, go up, get your red jacket, put on your socks and bring down your dirty clothes. And they come down with like a dirty, you know, dirty red uh, uh, sock and, you know, no jacket. And it's just like this jumble and you, you're you convinced they just hate you. And they're trying to uh, make sure that your morning gets off to a terrible start. It's not the case. It's a lot, it's a big mental load for them to hold on to. Um, I say, and I'll move on from this question, I promise, but same thing with the k, a, t. That requires some working memory, right? Because k, a, is different if there's suddenly an E, because now it's not k-et, it's k -et, right? So all that is working memory, um, and that's it can get bogged down in there. Um, what advice do you have for districts that are shifting from a balanced literacy approach to the science of reading research consisting of explicit and systematic teaching of phonics? So that's a great question. So first of all, bravo to anyone that's shifting away from balanced literacy and this idea that we can help kids guess at reading. Uh, uh, <laughs> topic for an, uh, a whole other webinar. But I think what we have to remember is that we we have to be patient and we have to be kind to one another when we're asking teachers who have spent a, so much of their life dedicated and invested in an approach that they they went to college and they spent a great deal of money to be told this is the way to do it. And now we're suddenly saying, uh-uh, you got to do it a different way. And turns out you have to learn how to do this really in your free time. We're not going to pay you anymore to do it. And I need you to take all that stuff you spent decades creating, throw it out the window and create new stuff. That's a lot. That's a lot, and it's not their fault that they're in this situation. So I think we have to have patience. I think we need to figure out ways to give time, and I think we have to give each other a lot of support as we go through um, uh, through this process, because it it, it is a lot. Um, would it benefit a college student diagnosed with ADHD to undergo psychological testing to determine if she if she also has dyslexia? How could knowing this help her? That's a it's a great question. So. Um, a couple of things, right? So I'm in college. Um, I've availed myself at this point. Um, I likely I have come up with some strategies that work well enough for me to, you know, get to higher ed. Is it really worth it for me to go back and get a formal diagnosis of dyslexia? Maybe, maybe not. Um, if that is a puzzle piece for this individual that would suddenly make them feel more whole or give them a narrative of right now of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just stupid. I, you know, I'm, I have to work harder than anybody else. Da, 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 and I'm lucky to be here. Um, if suddenly having a narrative understanding where those difficulties came from, and maybe also where those strengths are attributed, if that is meaningful to them, I think it's great and important. If, if having that dyslexia diagnosis would allow them to have supports that they don't currently have, then I think that would be important. But if we already have an ADHD diagnosis, we might already have access to the supports like extended time um, and, and notes from our professors and other things that we need. The one thing I will say is if I've, I've learned this recently, if we're in college and we want to go on to law or medical school or another board regulated area, and it's gonna get, you know, the, the, the parameters get tougher, um, that, that dyslexia diagnosis actually becomes super important because I've, I've been shocked at the number of brilliant people at brilliant schools of higher uh, education who go on to practice law or to study law or medicine. And when it comes to those board exams, because they don't have an official diagnosis of dyslexia, um, they don't get the support that they need. Um, and so uh, they're denied the extended time and all those things, which is absolutely ridiculous. So that, that could be a reason um, if, if we're planning on going down that road. Is there a way to uh, improve rapid retrieval? Is there a benefit in practicing uh, rapid letter naming? Great question. Um, letter recognition, 
letter sound recognition, important to practice, you know, uh, and, and helpful. Um, the actual speed of it, um, uh, uh, it, it, it it can improve. We can get better. We could we practice fluency a lot, which is when we have students practice reading the same passage um, over and over again, because there is something about just kind of getting them into that rhythm and that familiarity. And we want them to have as many exposures as possible, because the more exposures they have, they have the more likely it is that that connection becomes even stronger. Um, so that's super important. But I I I want to be careful about the idea of like. A, C, Q, do, do. That's not necessarily helpful or going to work. And um, uh, what Sally Shaywitz, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, talks a lot about, about dyslexia robs an individual of time. Uh, and that's so true. So the, for some kiddos, uh, we're, we're not going to make them rapid. It's just not going to happen. It's not the way their brain works. Um, but again, I, I emphasize that really rap, for the most part, we ask people to do things rapidly in schools and then never really again uh, 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 for the vast majority of professions. So um, it's something that we, what we want to do is we want to work on making that connection stronger to make it more efficient. Uh, and that hopefully over time will also make it quicker, but it's not necessarily an isolated skill that, that um, we're going to work on. Um, what program do you uh, base your younger education? Are you working with the goal for a student to return to a mainstream? So I'm assuming that's referring to Landmark School, right? What's our goal at, uh, you know, Landmark School as we work with younger kids? Our goal is to meet the kid where they're at and get them where, to we, where they need to be. Um, and that could mean that they're at Landmark for three years and then they leave us. It could mean that they come in third grade and they go all the way through 12th grade. It's really about understanding what that child needs and what makes sense for the family. Um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, Landmark or otherwise, when a, a child goes to a, a specialized school, it's wonderful, it's amazing, and it is a huge financial sacrifice a family never uh, intended to make. Um, and so that's a factor, right? We have to figure out, okay, what? how can we get the skills necessary to help a kid transition out just for financial or geographic reasons alone, um, uh, um, you know, and a variety of other things. So I think it it, uh, it all depends on, on, on those kind of things. But I think it's great about schools like a landmark is we're designed for the way kids think. Um, uh, uh, not just designed to help them to remediate them, we're designed for how they think, um, which again, I think is a, a different way of, of looking at it. Um, but again, it's really about what do we need to do to get this kid what they need in order to go to the next step of their journey, um, whatever that uh, uh, looks like. Um, what does the math classroom look like for students with dyslexia? Great question. That's a great question. And, and this fluctuates a little bit, a little bit, but I, I have read that upwards of 50% of kids with dyslexia are also going to, would also qualify for a math disability, dys, dyscalculia um, uh, is kind of the, the formal term for it. Um, so there, there, again, it's not unheard of for a child with dyslexia to also have a difficult time in math. But again, the, what that looks like can be just as complex, right? Is it, is it retrieval? Is it math facts? Um, uh, there are plenty of kids that really have a hard time with math facts, but that are great processors um, uh, uh, of, of, of going through math problems and all those things. Um, what I think, not just in a dyslexic classroom, in all math classrooms, no matter where you are, I think the, the boat that is missed that we are now starting to get on is that we really need to help kids with foundational skills of math. It's not that two times two is four. There's a element of that, but it's understanding what that actually means and looks like, right? Um, uh, why, why is two times two four, right? What does that look like? What does that mean? Um, uh, when we count by tens, right? Um, 10, 20, 30, 40, that's great that kids can do that rapidly, but do they even understand what that means, right? Um, and I think really spending more time on the foundational skills of helping have kids have a math brain that they can then apply as math gets more complex becomes really important. And that's visual, it's multi-sensory. It's, it's a lot of the same tenets that we talk about um, in structured literacy, we could look at uh, in math. Um, uh, we uh, recently learned that the RAND part of dyslexia cannot be remediated. However, is there anything that can support the slower processing piece of dyslexia, right? So rapid automatic naming, like I mentioned, we're, we're, we're that, that's not necessarily something we can improve. Um, but what we can do is figure out um, how can how can we offer you instruction and offer you support in a way that's just helpful and makes sense to you. Often that just comes down to, um, uh, uh, again, being very direct, very explicit. And then in the output stage, 
providing additional time. Um, again, school's artificial. The way that we measure in school is incredibly artificial. 50 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever the length of that period is, is completely made up. So one of the things that we need to recognize is that some kids will need more. Some kids are going to need more time and we need to make sure that they have the diagnosis or whatever they need um, in order to uh, have that, um, I think is, is uh, really important. Um, I also think in all of these, rapid automatic naming, no matter what, and it's a piece I should have highlighted earlier, what's also incredibly important is that kids understand how they learn and how um, and how they problem solve best. It's not about doing it right, wrong, or good or bad. The more that kids are aware of their own learning, metacognition is so important. Um, a, it helps the self-esteem piece because it gives them a narrative and understanding. But, you know, if, if I have, uh, you know, relatively low rapid automatic naming, um, I, I need to know as I go into a task that's going to demand it, that I can think through ahead of time, okay, this is going to be challenging for me. What might that mean? What's a strategy or a skill that I can uh, kind of bring to this? Um, because I know I'm not going to necessarily get better at that, but doesn't, you know, doesn't necessarily matter. What, what can I do in order to uh, accommodate it? I have a student who has low level decoding, but high level comprehension. However, the results in her neuropsych testing do not include dyslexia as part of her diagnosis. Um, what else might account for the differential? Interesting, interesting, interesting. Without seeing any of the testing, I, I, I would be hesitant to really even speculate. It could be that um, it wasn't great testing, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, it could also be sometimes, um, um, I, don't, I don't know in this particular case, so I hate even to conjecture, but attention sometimes plays a role, right? Um, uh, 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 just uh, maybe it's not even the decoding. Maybe we actually can decode, but we have a hard time attending long enough to the word to to read it accurately and correctly. Um, you know that could be it. Um, uh, 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 if but if I'm sitting there going, right, I'm having a really hard time with that. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm able to comprehend. Um, I don't know. I, I, I that's kind of classic dyslexia. But again, there's I'm sure there's other factors I just don't know enough to uh, address. Um, my child preps for a test, learns the vocabulary, discusses strategies, taking the test, and then fails. What is this? I know it sucks. I'm so sorry. So it's a number of things, or it could be a number of things. Um, one of it could just be straight up test anxiety, right? Especially for kids who know they have a difficult time with this, and they know it's important, right? And that there's a lot of consequence for this. It's not unusual for that anxiety to just kind of build up and they absolutely freeze, right? And 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 uh, that becomes an issue. And it's that retrieval piece again, right? It's inconsistent. It's not that kids don't know the word the, it's that they are inconsistent in their application or their, their ability to retrieve and pull it. Um, also having nothing an no idea, it could be a bit of an attention issue. Classic example for my son when um, he was younger, he, you know, he would, we would be working with his a tutor on breaking a word into syllables, right? And he could do it, right? And he would spell the word correctly to her orally. And she'd be like, yes, now, you know, spell it out right in the paper. And then he would literally spell it wrong immediately. Um, and it's because he had a, literally had such a hard time from here to here. And it was an attention issue, right? Um, uh, and, and, and a whole other webinar on that. ADHD is not an inability to attend. It's a difficulty regulating attention. And again, it has, it's not like, do they listen to you? It's attention as, as specific and as, as concentrated as going from here to here, right? Um, so that could be it, but that, that is a very classic profile because, and, and also when I'm dyslexic or I'm LD, a test is asking me to do all these things at once. I have to read the question. I have to figure out what the question's asking me. I have to figure out what, what, you know, um, what's the question about, what's the action it's taking, asking me to do, right? And then if it's multiple choice, there's always those trick answers that aren't there to actually help you whether or not you understand the answer. It's whether or not you can distinguish uh, the two, which again, I, I think is often very arbitrary uh, and a trick of the test. Um, um, struggles with rapid automatic name and orgasming thoughts in order to speak, not being able to hold the memory what one wants to say. If so, is there a term or keyword you suggest Googling to learn more about this? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to direct, make a direct correlation between rapid automatic naming and the ability to uh, uh, fluently uh, express oneself. I, I think there can be a correlation, but I think there's a lot of things. But um, uh, uh, 
expressive uh, 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 language disorder or developmental language disorder um, uh, is something that I think is, is uh, again, we could do a whole other webinar, but developmental language disorder, I think would be really interesting to look at. Uh, uh, might be a helpful thing to explore because um, uh, uh, there's a couple of things that can be going on. Sometimes people literally have a difficult time putting together language. Um, sometimes people have a hard time putting together their thoughts at the same rate in which they can create them, right? And that's more of the rapid automatic naming piece sometimes, right? My brain moves faster than my uh, ability to vocalize it. Um, but then there also could be, I just have a hard time actually developing the language that I want to express, right? Same thing can happen sometimes with receptive language. Um, I have a hard time uh, 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 putting together the language as it comes in. Um, so again, something to uh, uh, look at. Um, can you talk about the connection between dyslexia and math difficulties? I think I did that a little bit already. Um, when you say landmark is designed for how kids think, what are some of the biggest problematic differences between your school day and a regular public school? It's a great question. Um, I think, uh, uh, and I want to say regular public school necessarily, right? But, you know, more of a traditional setting versus not. Um, I think speed is a lot of it, right? I think assessment can often be a lot of it, right? We're, we're not giving kids the opportunity to um, display what they know or can do. Instead, we're asking kids to um, what we're actually measuring is your ability to do it in a very specific way that, again, I would argue is unique to schools and doesn't exist anywhere else. But I think that's a piece of it. And I also think what's um, what a lot of schools uh, uh, fail to realize is that kids don't stop being dyslexic after third period or kids don't stop being dyslexic outside of language arts class. Right. Um, uh, there's a great quote by Dr. Julie Washington that uh, she talks about if you can't read every test is a reading test. Um, and so what I mean by the way that we design for the way that our, our kids think, um, we, our, our, our kids often in an academic setting benefit from explicit instruction, having, um, as a, you know, again, a small example, we're going to give you instructions, we're going to give you orally, we're going to give them to you written, and we might even have some visual cues up there, just so you don't have to hold all of that information in working memory. And think about it, as we go into life and we go into our jobs, if you're the sticky note person who's got 12,000 sticky notes, that's probably because you have a hard time keeping it all in your head. But if you put it up there, right, suddenly you have a visual um, that kind of relieves your brain a little bit of the uh, pressure on it. I'm I'm a, a list guy. I, got, I have lists going at all times because otherwise I can't keep up with it all. But the moment I see it on the list, oh, yeah, I know exactly what I need to do. But I would have a hard, hard time um, you know, holding on to that. So. That's what I, I mean about the way that uh, kids think. We, we design the instruction for their success versus uh, uh, kind of leaving their success to uh, whether or not they can um, manipulate, uh, 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 you know, a multiple choice test, if you will, right? Um, and, and again, thinking about when I'm asking you to write a history essay, I need to be using the exact same language skills and structures and supports as I'm asking you to write it in the English, uh, in the English essay, right? But oftentimes in schools, we just don't see that crossover, right? Um, even though it's the same skills being demanded upon them, we don't, we don't make that connection. Um, if parents were to prioritize specialized education due to a finances or geography, um, is there evidence that intervention in elementary versus high school is better? Great question. The earlier the intervention, the better. The earlier the intervention, the more profound. The earlier the intervention, the more effective. Um, a lot of factors in that, but if 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 nothing else, just sparing kids the social emotional trauma, right, of of of, of uh, it not working for them and them knowing it's not working for them, the earlier we can intervene, the better. Dr. Nadine Dean Gab at Harvard um, talks a lot about the dyslexia paradox, and it's this idea of we know that the earlier we intervene for a child, the more profound the impact but our schools are set up to wait for a child to fail and then we intervene. Um, whereas we have enough knowledge now that we can intervene much earlier and we can prevent the failure from ever happening versus we're making the failure a prerequisite for their success. I'm sorry, a prerequisite um, uh, for the intervention. Um, do dyslexic thinkers also struggle with nonverbal working memory, the ability to make a mental picture in my head of what I'm reading in addition to verbal working memory? That's a really great question. So. Um, I would say yes, no, maybe. Um, again, in that spectrum of what all of uh, of, of how this exists, um, there are definitely um, some kiddos, excuse me, who um, 
uh, you know, good readers, when they read, they create them, I call them the movie in your head, right? You're actually visualizing what it looks like. Well, for some kids, I'm trying so hard on decoding. I'm tr trying so hard to retrieve that word. I don't have the mental energy left to build that movie in my head. And because of that, I get to third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. I have no idea anybody builds movies in their head because I've never had the opportunity to even do that. So and to your point about um, creating that mental picture, yeah, sometimes they are the, the mental load is so overtaxed in one area that there's just not the capacity to do it in the others. Um, there's a, a Linda Mood Bell, uh, which is a... Um, uh, an intervention strategy and, and resource that um, called a visualization verbalization. And that's a piece of it is explicitly helping kids understand what it looks like to create images um, uh, in their head. And again, it's a spectrum of things. I, I, I like, I, yeah, I, I can't, I'm really bad at putting things together because I'm really hard time visualizing, you know, when it says turn it to the right and, you know, attach, you know, the top to the bottom. I have no, I, I can't see it. I have no idea what in the world they're talking about. Um, uh, whereas others, you know, have huge strengths in that. My daughter's a good reader on grade level, and the school is not acknowledging that she has dyslexia. The school is making their own analysis, even though her testing with the neuropsych says otherwise. What would you do? I would, well, I will give you my PG rated version of what I do. Um, but often what happens, the challenge is, um, again, that wait to fail model. If they are not failing, there is no problem. Um, and what I often want to uh, talk about is, is the input matching the output? Yes, she might be at grade level, but is she having to work extraordinarily hard, much more and put more effort in than her peers to get to the same point? If that is the case, and we know her to um, be an intelligent, capable child, there's an imbalance here, right? That, that's what we should be intervening and looking at is how can we write that imbalance? At the same time, the vast majority of schools, and if, you know, especially our public schools, Understandably, when your job is to teach every single kid in the United States, we're we're, we're really working towards the the, the medium, right? When our, the job is not to help kids reach their potential, the job is to get kids to some kind of you know somewhat artificial uh, uh, average. And so, if they're meeting that, then they're meeting their job, if that makes sense. And so, there's less of an urgency um, to do it. Um, so now, at the same time. If we have a, dyslexia, a diagnosis of dyslexia, the school has an obligation um, uh, to make sure that they are meeting their needs. And so unfortunately, it requires a lot of fighting, a lot of yelling, um, uh, often a backdoor, an unfortunate backdoor, as if a child also has a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, that You qualify for a 504 plan because that's considered a medical intervention. And um, while you won't receive services for remediation, so if you're having a hard time reading, 504 plan is not going to get it for you, but a 504 plan can um, get you uh, uh, <clears throat> extended time, preferential seating, other things that aren't a solution, but can be a piece of it um, and um, tends to be a much more straightforward process, depending on where you're at and all those all those things. Um, but unfortunately, you just have to fight, fight, fight. And it just varies also so much by state. Um, uh, uh, having moved to the Northeast from the South just relatively recently, it's crazy to me how regionally we all work to solve a similar problem very differently or even understand the problem differently to begin with um uh, okay i think it's the last one um how does the classroom environment help or hurt their learning for example should there be more visual information on the walls improve lighting natural airflow etc what do we know about design and learning success um uh, uh and you know at landmark are we doing any of these things yeah so it's a great question so um I, I think there's there's kind of what we're coming to understand to just be good environmental pieces for learning, not necessarily having anything to do with LD, right? And then there's um, uh, uh, potentially some specific things for kids that are LD. So as an example, um, uh, we are coming to understand as a larger world, um, you know, not surprisingly, natural light, um, uh, exposure to uh, uh, nature of any sort. Um, uh, all of those things can actually make a big difference uh, for kids. There's um, there's studies out there that say even you know spending 15 seconds or uh, that's, don't quote me on that, but some uh, kind of a fairly brief period of time just looking outdoors, not even being outdoors, but looking outdoors can just be a great reset uh, for your attention, right? 
um, uh, uh, that that alone can help you kind of gain back some things. Um, so uh, I think that could be really important. I, I do think, um, uh, I, you know, as with all things, are there are people that are sensitive, more sensitive to uh, certain aspects than others. So my wife hates fluorescent lights. I, I, I could, I don't even know if it's a fluorescent light. It does not bother me whatsoever, but she's super sensitive to it. Um, and so, you know, uh, those kinds of things, if, if we have sensitivities, it's going to impact our learning because we're just not as available because we're distracted by things. So I think understanding that about ourselves um, can be really important. To your point about that kind of the visual information on the walls, yes and no. I think there's, there's, a, there's a level of oversaturation where it just becomes a distraction for some kids, but I think it can be as simple as you know, let's start the class and, and I'm going to go ahead and write the plan on the board of what we're going to do. You know, from um, 8 to 8.05, we're going to take attendance. I'm making this up. Um, from 8.05 to 8.15, we're going to work on our journals um, at, you know, 8, you know, and so on and so forth, just so that a, a, a child has something to look up to to kind of reorient themselves, right? Like, oh, okay, here, here's we are. Here's where we are in the plan. If I get a little lost or I get a little overwhelmed, oh, I'm going back up to the plan. Um, and I, I know where I am. Again, same with instruction, right? Um, not just standing um, and orally giving it at the beginning of the class, but I have a visual, I, I can have a, you know, a, a written version of it. I can have an oral version of it. And then maybe again, um, there's even like a display of it. Also similar in math, right? That's why going back to the idea of really foundational concepts, giving kids visuals of math, not just two times two is four, but a visual of some sort of two groups of two becoming four, right? That, that can be a, a support so that their brain has different pathways and different kind of shortcuts um, to get there uh, could be helpful. So all right, well, I first of all, thanks to everybody, all 67 of you who stuck in to the very end um, I'm amazed. Thank you. I hope this was helpful. Um, uh, you could always uh, 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 reach out to me through landmarkschool.org. Um, you could also go to uh, Landmark School Outreach, uh, where we have a lot of uh, resources. MadeByDyslexia.org has a lot of great resources, um, as does DyslexiaIDA.org, which is the International Dyslexia Association. So thanks so much for your time. Um, uh, and uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful night. And um, we will see you again soon.